So here's the Republican Party, right? I can't apply the standard of doing the right thing on January 6th about protecting democracy because then I wouldn't have any Republicans. It's, it's the greatest confession in the world. Good morning and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. It is officially the second half of October 2023. It is going to be an amazing week. Um, it's going to be an awful week. It's going to be a terrible week. It's going to be a completely implausible and improbable week. So who better to talk with than my friend and my colleague, Will Salatan. How are you, Will? I'm okay, Charlie. How about you? Okay, so um, I, I have to admit, I'm going to make a confession here. I, I find the whole story about the war in Israel to be very, very painful to deal with. So we're going to have to ease into it. And I'm, I'm sorry, we're just going to put this, we will, we're going to get to it. We have a lot of material on it. I want to spend some time on the absolute insanity of the speaker's race um, with, with one stipulation, because we're going to spend a lot of time talking about how absolutely insane and absurd it is to even consider the possibility of making Jim Jordan the Speaker of the House of Representatives, right? I mean, this is this is crazy. It is, however, not nearly as crazy as what the Republicans are planning to do by nominating Donald Trump to be the next president of the United States leader of the free world. So let's put this in perspective, right? As nutty as it is to put somebody like Jim Jordan um, in the in the presidential succession, putting Donald Trump, you know, in the presidency. So, I mean, when we're evaluating, you know, whether or not the normie caucus, the sanity caucus of the Republican Party is finally going to take a stand, kind of remember that they've already made it clear they're not going to take a stand on the big one. Okay, right. so we, we may have this little moment of sanity, but, you know, <laughs> what, what, one of my themes lately is to tell the listeners, you are not the crazy ones. Could we, so could we start off the week with a little bit of a, you are not the crazy ones palate cleanser? Is that okay with you, Will? <laughs> sure, sure. Okay, so here is an actual interview. This is a real person. This person votes. She may be somebody's grandma uh, who was interviewed at a MAGA rally uh, over the weekend talking about uh, the role that Space Force is going to play in the presidential election. And by the way, this would be big if true. So let's play this audio of this interview. The election, I believe, was stolen. But we know that Space Force has it all. Trump has all the, all Space the Force. information. It's going to be overturned. What do you think Space Force has? Space, Space Force is a military branch of the, you know, just like the Army, the, you know, all the military. And they literally, right. walk up here. Okay. They literally, the night of the election. Literally. They literally. Literally. Watch the election be stolen. They know, they watermark the ballots. They know exactly what happened with every ballot. They know what fake ballots, all right? They saw, they knew the election switches. They know what countries were involved. They know, they followed the money. They know what every politician every. that's been paid off. If they satellites. know there's, um, there was 260,000, 269,000 uh, sealed indictments, but I think it might even be up to 500,000 sealed indictments. Well, that's big. And I believe that we're going to have an emergency broadcast and the military is going to come in with martial law. Oh. And we are going to be shown eight hours on, eight hours off of videos for seven days, the world. And they're going to be showing us taped uh, tribunals, taped confessions. She's looking and forward to this. The world is going to be awakened to what's really going on oh. with the deep state. Wow. I don't know. So maybe we ought to change our plans. Just don't don't make any long term plans, Will, because uh, <laughs> this woman is looking forward to all of that. There's a little bit of queuing on there, but you know, part of it is, and, and, and I'm sorry to keep coming back to this. This this is probably somebody's mom or grandma. So probably in her daily life, you know, she you know bakes casseroles for neighbors who go through things, right? She's <laughs> right. She, she she buys tricycles for her kids, and yet. There she is, very matter-of-factly explaining to this interviewer, yeah, yeah, Space Force uh, knows everything. And Space Force, and you're looking around going, okay, no, Space Force, because it's got satellites, knows all this stuff. And, and, and also, somehow, she didn't quite explain how they watermark the ballots. Um, <laughs> but there's going to be hundreds of thousands of indictments. Charlie, there's Space Force. Of course, they watermark ballots. That's what Space Force... 
among other things, this lady has a lot of faith in lawyers. Five hundred thousand indictments. Yeah, I'm trying right. to imagine the production on televised. That, right? Right. Eight hours on, eight hours off, televised tribunals. We will, I, did you say we'll be forced to watch them? <laughs> we can, right? She's, got, she's talking about the countries that are involved. I guess that's uh, Hugo Chavez. I'm not sure who else is in on that. But, there were some okay. Italian satellites. Uh, look, the Italians, I mean, that's right. <laughs> okay, so have I made the point that you are not the crazy ones? But I, I, I guess let's just set this aside for a future conversation, Will, about the sort of the nature of insanity and the, how widespread it is, because insanity can be overused. But I have to tell you, there are a lot of really, really crazy people out there. I mean, can we just can we stipulate that? Um, I'm not going to say which show it was because I don't want to embarrass them. But I was I was on a show and I had to I, I sat there for about 20 minutes before it was my turn listening to callers call in. And I have to tell you, um, Will, it's enough to make you doubt your faith in democracy. <laughs> and, and I'm not talking about people who are uninformed or, or, or even, even, even the folks who basically think that, you know, just string together bumper sticker cliches, talking points, and think they're engaging in some sort of intelligence. I'm not, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about people who believe really seriously batch crazy things and they vote and they get elected and they determine the future of our government i'm afraid i mean no look they they may not they may not be the people who actually determine but you know as we just get into this conversation kind of remember when we say that there are politicians who are really afraid of the base (laughs) really okay all right I, i i have a couple serious points and Please. Then, but I but I got a pony. I got a pony for you. Actually, you already gave me the pony. So mm. uh, the mm. serious points are mm. this lady we just heard talking about uh, tribunals. She she says the military is going to come in with martial law. There's going to be tribunals and taped confessions. And this is her idea of a rescue operation. This right? is Christmas. Right. And so the serious point is. This is how authoritarianism comes to America in the name of democracy, right? The the people's votes were were stolen. Well, 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 so okay, the well, milit- she she is she's nuts. <laughs> I mean, let's let's, okay. let's not get too serious, okay? I mean, this woman is okay, but she's but let's nuts. let's also she's nuts, she's nuts. <laughs> but in addition to this crazy lady, there was a discussion yeah. in the White House, right? I know where Donald Trump left, Mike Flynn and the others, right, talking about exactly this: the military rerunning the Italian the, space the- satellites, right? Wasn't right. That, so was some of there that? was this crazy, these crazy people discussed this in the White House with the president and he yeah. was one of them. Right. OK, so that's the serious one. The pony, of course, the pony, Charlie, is the casserole. Right. Because the people who are spouting this garbage, they are baking casseroles and they're perfectly functional in other parts of their life. So mm-hmm. somehow people can be absolutely nuts and say this crazy stuff. And then go about their daily lives as moms and grandmas. I, and I am not as I, I'm not sure that that is as reassuring as you think it is. You know, <laughs> but basically saying, okay, so yes, there are zombies, but you know, most of the time you can't tell the zombies; they walk among <laughs> us. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just not sure that 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 makes my day. But to your point about you now, and I, again, I'm I'm kind of you know brushing her off as as nuts. But you make the point that okay, we can say this woman is nuts, but. Um, I will, um, I will see you and, and, and raise you a Mike Lindell, Mr. My pillow guy right. who was at the right. white house, Mike Flynn, who is a, was a general and was the national security advisor. Um, Rudy Giuliani, you know, Sidney Powell, the Kraken. I mean, so the problem is, is that there's that we have the, this line between completely insane and completely corrupt and completely seditious is kind of blurry, isn't it? I mean, that, it is. that's that's the moment we're in. So. It is. Can I, and can I come back to your point about the base, that these politicians are following the yeah. base and the craziness of it? So this happened on Saturday in New Hampshire. Mike Pence is up there. Yes. And there's another one of these casserole ladies, right? She gets yeah. up and she says to him, how are you going to get elected? He's like, how am I going to get elected? Yeah. She says, yeah, because after the vote, she says, this is a quote, that's where it all goes away. Somebody comes along and just takes a bunch and puts it in the back of a truck. 
and Mm. takes it away. And what does Mike Pence say? Does Mike Pence say, I'm sorry, ma'am, no, that doesn't happen. Elections are actually free and fair in this country. No, Mike Pence says, yeah, I hear you. Well, and he starts going into his thing. My secret weapon is New Hampshire. So Mike Pence knows this lady is nuts and he doesn't correct her because he's afraid to correct her. And this is what's happening. Or he's exhausted. (laughs) <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not. Is that a certain point you just kind of roll your eyes and go, yeah. Um, meanwhile, back in the real world, <laughs> no. Um, yeah, that, that there are more of those folks out there. So let's talk about where we're at here, because uh, you know when I talk about this being an implausible, improbable week, uh, we have the uh, the what's about to happen in Congress, which is amazing. I, I I think it's fair to say, and feel free to disagree with me here. Really, literally, no one knows what's going to happen this week. I mean, this is one of those. I mean, no one has any idea. So for those of you catching up who actually had a real life, Steve Scalise won the vote for um, speakership. Um, That flamed out in less than about 24 hours, right? Jim Jordan immediately jumped up and said, you know, I want to try again. The House conference gets together. He wins the vote. But there were a surprising number of votes for this dark horse guy. We, we leave that aside. And then, Will, I mean, was this Jim Jordan's idea, this weird validation vote, this sort of other second vote basically saying, so how many of you would actually be willing to vote for this complete numb nuts to be speaker? <laughs> how many of you will vote for him on the floor? Now, keep in mind, here's the math. Um, he can only afford to lose four. More right. than 50 Republicans voted no. So Jim Jordan spent the weekend trying to arm twist, bully, sick Sean Hannity on people, threaten people. Well, you know, Donald Trump is supporting me. The base is going to come after you like this lady. They're going to be really pissed if you don't do it. Um, so he's going to force a vote on the floor. Uh, there is uh, there is a, a group of normies who have said that they're not going to vote for him. There might be another candidate on them. So what do you think? Tell me what you think of the, this, 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 this state of play here. Are we going to go through another 15 to 20 ballots before people decide that putting Jim Jordan in the speaker is just too nuts even for this Republican Party? Well, first of all, there is nothing too nuts for this Republican Party. So let's set that one aside. OK, right. yeah. uh, the Scalise vote was actually the big one because that tells. So McCarthy gets chucked. Scalise yeah. is the the guy. He's the number two. Right. right. He's the most logical choice. Eric he's Aaron. the one who <clears throat> he has the best relationships with other House yeah. Republicans. The fact that Scalise couldn't get enough tells you we're already in a, I mean, there's, he was, he had the best chance. He had the best chance. So every, everything from here on in is less likelihood of it. The fact that Jordan is the next guy up is because the crazies are in control because the crazies, the Matt Gateses are the ones who won't vote for anyone who doesn't, isn't exactly like, so all of the normie Republicans to the extent that they still exist are kind of out of the equation because they're the ones who are flexible, right? They'll be just like, give me Austin Scott, give me somebody to vote for, right? Sorry, that's the dark horse guy. Right. Um, And so we're in the stage where we have to appease the crazies because that's where the Republican party is. And there's very little likelihood of getting, of getting enough votes. So I I don't see, I don't see a way out of it. The, the, and the, the crazy vote that you brought up, Charlie, we, let, you know, how many of you would vote for me on the floor? That's because the Republicans are afraid to take this to the floor because yeah. it's going to show everyone how nuts and well, chaotic. Well, but they're going to do it. They're going to do it because uh, Jim Jordan apparently wants to get people on the record so that he can beat them up. So I just think, look, there's at least, correct me if I'm wrong, tw- uh, at least 12 uh, Republican congressmen who were elected in districts that Joe Biden won. Clearly, there are a lot of people who know who Jim Jordan is, who know he's an idiot, who know he can't be trusted, um, who are, are just cannot stand the idea. So the question is, will there be more than four who will just say no or vote for somebody else? And I think there's a high likelihood of that. Again, I don't I don't want to be the the optimist here. So then what happens? Then the question is, all right. Um, there's, there's, there has been a lot of, I think, wish casting over the weekend about how, you know, maybe they should caucus with the Democrats, elect Hakeem Jeffries, people that is just not going to happen. They are not going to elect Hakeem Jeffries. But is it at this point completely impossible that there could be a bipartisan deal to say, keep Patrick McHenry in position, but, 
you know, and empower him, you know, but with with the requirement that you don't shut down the federal government, that you vote on aid for Ukraine and Israel, um, and that you m- maybe change some of the the floor rules. Is that impossible, Will? I uh, I wouldn't say impossible. First of yeah. all, yeah, none of this is totally impossible because right. we're in the re- we're in the realm of the unlikely already. Right. Everything the interesting. Unlikely. So the interesting thing to me is that Hakeem Jeffries was on one of the talk shows yesterday and he said, I'm, we're not playing for an individual. We're not, we're not, we're not negotiating that we right. want a, a specific speaker. No. He wants to get, so correct me if I'm wrong. The Hastert rule is the one that says, if they don't, if you don't have a majority of Republicans supporting right. whatever the legislature, it doesn't right. even come to the floor. Yeah. So he wants to get rid of that. That's his deal. We'll, we'll come on board. And he's not saying support me, Hakeem Jeffries, because he knows he's not going to get that. We'll cut a deal with you to give you our votes for speaker, for a speaker, and then you won't have to capitulate to the crazies. You don't need Gates's vote because you got mine in exchange for waiving that rule. And then the House would be much more bipartisan than it is. And the question is, can things get bad enough in the Republican Party that they would make that deal? Because right. there are enough. Lo- exactly so those right. those yeah. folks in the Biden districts, Charlie, that you brought up, they'd be happy to make that deal. I Maybe. Think. Or, yeah. they, but but they, but they're also inviting being primaried, and and even even if it's in an overwhelmingly um, you know Biden district or even an overwhelmingly Republican district, the primary is is you know is is a scary prospect for all of them. So I don't know. I mean, either way strikes me for those guys strikes me as as potentially political suicide. Um, yeah. They they vote for Jim Jordan, they they'll lose their seats in the general election. Um, they vote against Jim Jordan, they might lose their seats in a primary election. But but those. Let me come back to those because you said yeah, there are 12 yeah. of them, right? And I don't know the, right? what the exact yeah, number is. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But it's it's relatively few. And that's the problem, okay? Because the more districts we can create where the incentive structure is to win in the general that's election right. the, as opposed to the primary, the more sane the Republican Party will be. It shouldn't be that winning the primary is the whole ball game in your district. You right. sh- should be sh- competitive districts then you have to behave like a normal person who has to win some people on the other side of the political aisle. So over the weekend, there was, you know, obviously, as you know, people are going on the Sunday morning talk shows to talk about, uh, really, Jim Jordan, seriously? Um, you, you you think that, that he is a he's a viable candidate for, for a speaker, that this actually makes sense for the, the Republican Party? Um, one of the more interesting exchanges was Jake Tapper and Dan Crenshaw. Now, I've written about Dan Crenshaw in the past. There's a whole segment of folks out there that want to believe in Dan Crenshaw, that want to think that Dan Crenshaw represents something something new and refreshing and independent. And one of those is Dan Crenshaw, who actually wrote a whole <laughs> book about values and virtue and everything. And, and our, our, our colleague, Tim Miller, did a review of it. It's really a remarkable book because he, you know, he, he'll talk through the, the, the values and the principles and the character traits that you want in, in a good leader and somehow reconcile that with sucking up to Donald Trump. I mean, it's, it's impossible to do, but Dan Crenshaw is one of these guys that wants to say, no, I'm actually sane, normal and decent. And yet there he is on the Sunday shows yesterday explaining why he's supporting Jim freaking Jordan to be the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Listen to this. What, what I would remind a lot of, uh, of the members who are against Jordan, um, you know, because, because his, his reputation precedes him, but his reputation has changed over time. He has become part of the solution, not part of the problem. He has long <laughs> since been part of the solution. I've had a lot, of, a lot of good conversations with him. I've gotten to know him. Uh, there, there, there's a reason I support him. Um, he was trying giving to... McHenry additional powers. Well, that still requires that still requires a, a, a vote, you know. And what kind of powers? I mean, at a certain point, you're just electing a speaker. Yeah. And so, it, and he doesn't want that. He's asking us not to do that. I mean, he defied the congressional subpoena, and he was trying to get Pence to overturn Jake the electoral votes. But yeah. anyway, you're you're in the you're in the Jordan <laughs> camp. Uh, but a lot of them did that. If I if I held that grudge, I'd, I wouldn't have friends in right, the that's Republican two, that's conference. Two-thirds of the, of the, that's two-thirds of the conference. That's two-thirds of the conference. That's a, that's an excellent point. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was on an wait, island there. Yeah, wait, I hear Okay, so let's just translate that. Uh, e, e, you know, e, Ian Bass, and I, I don't have it right in front of me, but basically, yeah, all of my friends are like seditionists who tried to overturn the election. And, you know, if, if I actually held sedition against them, then I'd have no friends whatsoever. <laughs> right. What right. What was the Republican complaint about the teachers unions that were were passing all the kids who should be flunking who've lowered the standards? So here's the Republican Party, right? I can't apply the standard of doing the right thing on January 6th about protecting democracy because then I wouldn't have any Republicans. 
Yeah. It's it's the greatest confession in the world. So I don't want to beat this horse too much, but I think this would be a good moment just to remind ourselves about who Jim Jordan is. I mean, Jake Tapper mentioned that he refused uh, uh, to comply with a congressional subpoena, you know, so much for uh, his collegiality. Um, this is from uh, David Korn and I think Dan Friedman from uh, from Mother Jones. I mean, here's the strange world that I'm quoting from Mother Jones, but just reminding us who Jim Jordan was. J Jordan was an early and enthusiastic recruit in Trump's war on the republic and reality in public and in private. Days after the November election, he spoke at a Stop the Steal rally in front of the Pennsylvania state capitol. He spread election conspiracy theories within right-wing media. He endorsed Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell's bogus claim that Dominion voting systems and Smartmatic had robbed Trump of electoral victory. Okay, so now we're looping back to the crazy lady. Jim Jordan is this far away from her. You know, he's right. he was he was spreading the, the Dominion voting lie, which, by the way, cost Trump. Uh, Fox, uh, what, $787 million. Um, he called for a congressional investigation of electoral fraud for which there was no evidence and demanded a special counsel be appointed. He endorsed state legislatures canceling vote tallies and selecting their own presidential electors. He urged Trump not to concede. He demanded that Congress not certify Joe, Bid uh, Joe Biden's victory in the ceremony scheduled for January 6, 2021. Behind the scenes, he schemed with Trump. The final report of the House Select Committee on January 6th lays out in damning detail Jim Jordan's participation in Trump's election thwarting machinations. Quote, Representative Jordan was a significant player in President Trump's efforts, the committee said. He participated in numerous post-election meetings in which senior White House officials, Rudy Giuliani and others, discussed strategies for challenging the election. Chief among them claimed the election had been tainted by fraud. As early as November, Jordan was, quote, involved in discussions with White House officials about Vice President Mike Pence's role on January 6th, the report noted. Conversations that focused on whether Pence could block the certification of Biden's win. Jordan was one of 10 Republican members of Congress who attended a White House meeting on December 21st, where the topic was how to pressure Pence to undo the election. And we could spend the rest of the podcast going through just remember who Jim Jordan was. You know, Jim Jordan, the guy who was responsible for the tweet, you know, you know, Elon Kanye Trump. Um, right. He's the guy who is continuing to harass uh, Fonnie Willis because he sees his role um, in Congress as being the obstructor in chief. So it, it is worthwhile. I mean, then putting this in context. So there's Dan Crenshaw saying, hey. If I held this against everybody, I'd have no friends. Right, Dan. That probably should tell you something. <laughs> right. OK. Now, you and I have talked about this before, and you have made the point, and you're right, that Jordan is not just another one of right. the Republicans who voted against uh, yeah. certifying the election. Right. So Jordan went further than others. And let me just come to that last point. By the way, love Mother Jones. I used to write for Mother Jones. David Korn's a great guy. Friedman's a great guy. There. So from Mother Jones and, to the bulwark. <laughs> OK. <laughs> And what, yeah. what I love about them is that they are very fa focused on facts, right? And right. and that article that you just mentioned, they've laid out a lot of facts. And let me just come to the last one, because I think that's the important that one. Jordan, there are varying degrees of complicity and guilt in January 6th. There were a lot of people who lied after the election and spouted fraud and all that. But Jordan was one of the guys who was behind the scenes. He was in the meetings. And as you get closer and closer to January 20th, 2021, you get to January 6th, you get conspiracies to go beyond January 6th. Right. Jordan's participation in that meeting where they're trying to get Pence to stop the certification and push things past January 6th. Now you're getting into territory where you're going to keep the defeated president in power past when the Constitution says he's supposed to be out of power. It's, it's that much further into the madness. And Jim Jordan, we, we, we must never forget his role in that. We must Further never forget that we, we, that we don't even know enough about him because his, of his defiance of the subpoena, right? And Liz Cheney has said, Jordan's not just another pretty face here. Not, right. In this case, not just another ugly face, right? He's particularly complicit in this. He's particularly dangerous. And uh, I, I, it's not, I would say, in a, in a choice between Scalise and Jordan, it's not close. I was wrong yeah. about that last week. Yeah. And yeah. Okay, so um, in another mind-blowing mo moment that uh, would, would cut against any any optimism about the GOP normies, Mike Pence was asked about this over the week, and Mike Pence says that Jim Jordan would make a great speaker. 
See, I, I have to tell you, you know, guys like Mike Pence just continue to blow my mind. At some point, you, every once in a while, you'll think, okay, Mike Pence has suddenly realized, I'm not going to be president. I'm not going to win this nomination. I'm going to go out in a blaze of glory. I'm going to say what at what I think. I'm going to call out the seditionists. I'm going to say that Donald Trump tried to get me to ignore the Constitution. And that, you know, that's the hill I'm going to die on. And and then it's like Mike Pence goes, no, no, no. Um, and Jim freaking Jordan. I mean, how, how do you explain this to me, Will? Well, people you know, always Mike ask Pence, me to explain this stuff, and it's like, okay, I'm, 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 I'm done. I'm, I'm out of material. Okay, it does matter that Mike Pence on January sixth didn't go along with the plot. Yes, to, to stop the certification. It always matters. We're going to give Pence mm -hmm. credit for that. But having said that, Pence is one of these guys who's very concerned with his personal piety, his personal reputation. I did the right thing by God's grace. He always says, you right. know, thanks to God, I yeah. did the right thing. And you know, uh -huh. that's and really, that's great. That. Yeah. That's really wonderful. But if you're interested in protecting the United States, as opposed to your personal reputation, then it can't end on January 6th. You can't after January 6th and having done the right thing, well, then exactly. turn around and say, I'll put a guy like okay. Jim Jordan back in power because you know, that, so why is he doing it? What wouldn't this be a moment of saying, the Republicans have so many brilliant, bright people in the House of Representatives. How about somebody that did not try to overturn the election? Was it the, goes back. This goes back to the Dan Crenshaw problem. Exactly. Boy, says that they exactly. got nobody, right? Exactly. It's uh, <laughs> because look. Let's go back up. Remember, Liz Cheney is what you would do if you're serious about right, protecting the Constitution, yeah, right. right? You, yeah. you are a Kinsinger. Mm -hmm. You draw a line. You say anybody who doesn't meet the test of defending the Constitution is out. And if that means, you know. 67% of the House Republican Conference, then so be it. I'm going to protect the Constitution. Once you go down the Crenshaw road of saying, hey, you know, I got to work with what I got here, and that's where the Republican Party is, then you're just dropping standards one by one, you know? And so this is just another one. Pence ends up saying, right. yeah, Jordan's okay, because that's who the House Republicans would nominate. I don't know. I'm, I'm, we're like five minutes away from somebody saying we should just check with Space Force who they think we should. I do. All right, let's switch gears because um, on a much more serious level, and I guess this is part of this split screen uh, world that we live in where we have clown world and then we have real world and real world is brutal. And it's kind of reminding you that, that the world is deeply, deeply serious, grave at the point you're playing these stupid games which will, will, will continue. So let's talk about what's going on with Israel, which is preparing um, a ground offensive in Gaza. Um, of course, now the debate is, is, is shifting from the Hamas atrocities to are the, you know, is Israelis, are they going to not show enough restraint? Are they going to engage in, 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 in atrocities? And let's just play some of the, the, the sound bites that uh, we've talked about uh, over, over the weekend, um, sort of a, a, a scatter shot. Ron DeSantis... Um, is trying to capitalize on this crisis. You saw that he has like his own air, like Air DeSantis, flying people <laughs> yes. out of Israel and everything. <laughs> well, he was on one of the talk shows talking about uh, all the people in Gaza. Let's listen to this. Uh, the two million people who live in Gaza, half of them are under the age of 18. Let's take a listen to something you said yesterday. We cannot accept people from Gaza into this country as refugees. I am not going to do that. Uh, if you look at how they behave, not all of them are Hamas, but they are all anti-Semitic. I'm sure you know all Arabs are Semites, but how can you paint with such a broad brush to say 2.3 million people are anti-Semitic? Well, first of all, uh, my position is very clear. Uh, those Gaza refugees, Palestinian Arabs, should go to Arab countries. The U.S. should not be absorbing um, any of those. I think the culture, so they elected Hamas. Let's just be clear about that. Not everyone's a member of Hamas. Most probably aren't, but they did elect Hamas. In 2006, and system, then the military occupation happened after that, where well, they went in and haven't finish, allowed elections since 2007. So in 2006, there was know, an election. I know, but there was, a lot of, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of celebrating of those attacks. Um, in the Gaza Strip uh, by, by a lot of those folks who were not Hamas. But if you look at their education system, this has been an issue for a long time. They teach kids to hate Jews. The textbooks do not have Israel even on the map. Uh, they prepare very young kids 
uh, to commit terrorist attacks. So I think it's a toxic culture. And I think if we were to import large numbers of those to the United States, I think it would increase anti-Semitism in this country. And I think it would increase anti-Americanism yeah. in this country. OK, so um, do you want to comment on this or, or should we play um, yeah. Nikki Haley? She, but she was asked. Uh, we can go to Haley if you want. I definitely want to comment on this. But uh, okay, the, the yeah. Nikki Haley was asked about this as well, just to get the the kind of the the, the back and forth on this. Is Nikki Haley asked to respond to Ron DeSantis's comments that that we, we shouldn't have anybody from Gaza here because they're all anti Semites? Nikki Haley, according to recent polling earlier this year uh, from the Washington Institute, which is a an, a, a pro Israel group, using the polling of a Palestinian Center for Public Opinion. 62% of Gazans wanted the ceasefire with Israel to stay in place. 50% of Gazans want Hamas to stop calling for Israel's destruction, want Hamas to accept a permanent two-state solution based on the 1967 borders. 70% of Gazans wanted the Palestinian Authority from the West Bank to take over Gaza. So I'm not really sh certain that Governor DeSantis has a real read on the difference between Hamas and the people of Gaza. What was your response when you heard what Governor DeSantis said? You know, I dealt with this every day for two years. And, you know, what I can tell you is you have to realize that whether we're talking about Gazans and Palestinians, um, you know, all of them don't. You've got half of them at the time that I was there didn't want to be under Hamas's rule. They didn't want to have terrorists overseeing them. They knew that they were living a terrible life because of Hamas. You had the other half that supported Hamas and wanted to be a part of that. We see that with Iran, too. The Iranian people don't want to be under that Iranian regime. They don't. We saw what happened to Masa Amini. We saw how they treat them. There are so many of these people who want to be free from this terrorist rule. They want to be free from all of that. And America's always been sympathetic to the fact that you can separate civilians from terrorists. Okay, so, Will, there seems to be kind of a difference of opinion there. Yeah, okay, so, folks, uh, look, I am Jewish. I am, I, it, it's, it's painful to me and my community that so many Jews were murdered in this Hamas attack. Just going to stipulate that. I have, that's, I have a a personal interest in this topic. Having said that, okay, having said that, what Ron DeSantis said here, this is how evil happens on the other side. This is how we become the bad guys. Uh, in the name of fighting prejudice, right, he says they're all anti-Semitic. He doesn't say Hamas is anti-Semitic, which is true. He says all the Palestinians in Gaza are anti-Semitic, right? And Margaret Brennan points out, that half of them are under 18. Ron DeSantis says, it doesn't matter. He said, they teach the kids to be anti-Semitic. Yeah. The children of Gaza, he's saying, are presumptively anti-Semitic and shouldn't be allowed to come to the United States. Okay, so that's, that's one step. The, uh, he quotes, he says, you know, they elected Hamas, right? And Margaret Brennan, Margaret Brennan points out that was in 2006. That's 17 years ago, 17 years ago. And and when she says they haven't allowed an election, she's not talking about Israel. She's talking about Hamas. Hamas has not allowed right. a, a vote in, in Gaza. So and then and then Tapper has the he has the numbers from the poll. Right. Mm -hmm. So that it, it's bullshit. what what DeSantis is saying is just wrong about what people in Gaza. Well, believe. but I mean, but the, the, the larger point, though, is he's trying to say there should be collective guilt and that yes. we, we should not that no one from Gaza should ever be allowed in. But but and I want I have another soundbite for you, because. Then this also can translate into, therefore, we shouldn't have any sympathy for what is about to happen to anyone here. Here's Tom Cotton, a Republican senator from Arkansas, talking about um, the basically the coming coming attack on, on, on Gaza and the possibility of massive civilian casualties. Israel has inflicted no suffering on Gaza. Hamas is responsible for the suffering in Gaza. They've been in charge there for 16 years. They didn't have to spend the billions of dollars they get from countries like Iran on things like tunnels and missiles. They could have spent it on water and power plants. Hamas is the only, the only, their sole responsibility for any suffering the people of Gaza have currently, have already had, or for any civilian casualties in Gaza, because Hamas intentionally uses women and children and the elderly for human shields. But, and if, if you don't want your hospitals or your schools or your mosque bombed, you shouldn't use them for military purposes. But you know the images that we're going to get. They're going to say, this is Israel. They are carpet bombing and blanketing um, the Gaza Strip in a way that leaves, first of all, food and water cut off, a humanitarian crisis and destruction there. 
Shannon, as far as I'm concerned, Israel can bounce the rubble in Gaza. Anything that happens in Gaza is the responsibility of Hamas. Okay, bounce the rubble. Everything is the responsibility. Okay, Let, let's parse this out because on one level, I, I want to agree that everything that's happening is because of what Hamas, well, ha Hamas began the atrocities. It wants to inspire more. Um, right. I mean, it, it is causes. On the other hand, there's something breathtaking about Tom, you know, Cotton essentially saying whatever happens when they bounce the rubble, it's not Israel's fault. I mean, it's how do you parse out the clear guilt and responsibility of Hamas without basically saying, and yeah, here's a complete blank check for Israel to do anything to anyone. Yeah. In Gaza Strip, yeah. I mean, you know, no, I mean, I, this, this is where you you just feel that it's. I mean, it is. There's, there ought to be some moral clarity here, but it is. It's going to be painful and it's going to be difficult, and there are no good answers to this. I think. Yeah. No. What do you so think? let. Yeah, I agree with you. The blank check thing is is the scary part here. Charlie, I agree with you about moral clarity. Right. Moral clarity says things like. Hamas is deliberately targeting civilians. True. Is, Israel may end up killing civilians, but it won't be deliberate. It would be inadvertent, right? right? And then that, right. that, that, that distinction matters. The, the right. way that Hamas conducted its invasion, targeting civilians rather than soldiers, that's, that's relevant. These are all parts of moral clarity. But part of moral clarity also, moral clarity can't mean that we completely disregard any other moral considerations because we're the righteous ones. That's not moral clarity, right? That's blindness, that's ideology, that's dogmatism. And that is the road to hell. When you think you're yeah. so righteous that nothing you do can be wrong. So when Tom Cotton says that last line, anything that happens in Gaza is the responsibility of Hamas, he is giving a blank check. And just because you are the more morally right party in a war does not mean you can do anything, right? You still have the laws of war. What makes you different is that you respect the laws of war. You respect the distinction between sold enemy soldiers and civilians. So no, it is not true that anything that happens in Gaza is entirely the, the, the fault of Hamas, right? There, there is, must still be proportionate behavior by the Israelis. You're still responsible for your own behavior. I mean, yes, Absolutely. I mean, this is the, the overwhelming guilt here is, is, is Hamas, but that does not mean that everyone else then is absolved of responsibility for the decisions that they make in the acts that they take. Okay, so another soundbite here. Uh, your good friend, Lindsey Graham, um, because of course, <laughs> people who have who've, who've listened to this and watched this know that, that Will has written the definitive account of Lindsey Graham's descent into authoritarianism. Um, you can buy the book, you can read the article, you can listen to the podcast. So Lindsey Graham was on yesterday and has a couple of interesting things to say. Here's, here's Lindsey Graham. If Hezbollah, which is a proxy of Iran, yeah, launches a massive attack on Israel. I will consider that a threat to the um, to to the state of Israel, existential in nature. I will introduce a resolution in the United States Senate to allow military action by the United States in conjunction with Israel to <laughs> knock Iran out of the oil business. Iran, if you escalate this war, we're coming for you. Okay, so your thoughts, Will? You are a student of Lindsey Graham. That's that that's like the old. <laughs> You know, saber saber rattling Lindsay, though, isn't it? Right, it is. Now, last week you were saying I was talking about, oh, if only we could retaliate against Iran, and you pointed out, look, be careful what you wish for, right? You know, you don't want to expand this war. In fact, yeah. all of American diplomacy is to try to limit it. Right. But in the name of trying to limit it, Lindsay is now explicitly threatening United States, not Israeli, United States military engagement attacking Iran, right? And what's interesting to me about this, in addition to that, it's a little bit dangerous to talk this way is who exactly made Lindsey Graham in charge of Joe Biden's foreign policy, right? And the answer is nobody. The answer is nobody. But this, this is why, uh, this is a major reason why Lindsey Graham became a Trump flunky, because he loved when Trump was president, he could say, you in Iran, I have been talking to Donald Trump. Yeah. Donald yeah, Trump's yeah. my buddy, and he's going to do the following to you if you nice come in to this conflict. Right. But he doesn't have that now. So now he just has to say, I'm going to introduce some resolution in the Senate. 
Okay, so um, Lindsey Graham is, in fact, as you as you accurately describe him, a Trump flunky. But um, on that same program, he he kind of he said that that uh, Trump's comments about how smart Hezbollah was and his attacks on Israel being a bunch of jerks and idiots and everything uh, was a big mistake. Um, I hesitate to ask this question um, because I think you and I both know the answer. But there was a lot of sort of you know Henry like, well, will this. This latest gaffe by Donald Trump, will this make a difference? The fact that at this moment, he makes it all about himself, of the narcissism of Donald. See, the thing about Donald Trump, and again, just come back to it. There's no ideology here. There's no through line of principle. It's all about him. It's all about his grievances and everything. So he's mad at Benjamin Netanyahu because Benjamin Netanyahu called up Joe Biden and congratulated him. So, you know, um, Trump tried to walk back his comments about how smart Hezbollah was. That you know, there's no better friend of Israel. But you know, and even Lindsey Graham's calling him out on. But it's not going to make a difference, is it? Because we're like way past that. We're way past any moment at which anything Donald Trump does is actually going to be the breaking point, right? Right. There, or, there is or, no breaking. Or do you have a more optimistic view than that? I'm I'm open to this. From no, me. I don't. And yeah. and it's so. It, there's two points here, Charlie. One is the political point you're making that the Republican voters won't don't don't care about any of yeah. this. They still vote for Trump no matter what. But the other thing is, it's just amazing to me that people like Lindsey Graham are always trying to draw this distinction between, oh, you know, Donald Trump just said this outrageous thing, like uh, attacking, you know, criticizing Netanyahu and mm-hmm. claiming that he didn't support Trump when. When Israel's literally under a mortal, you know, a, a, a deadly attack, um, and at the same time, so Lindsey Graham says this is he shouldn't say this stuff, but he keeps calling it what is it a mistake? This is not a mistake, no. right? What what what's what's lacking here is Donald Trump is a very bad person, right? Who doesn't care about anything but himself. That's why he says what he says about Israel. That's why he says let's overturn the That's Constitution. That's why it is so dangerous for anyone who cares about America's role in the world to even entertain the possibility of returning Donald Trump to the Oval Office. And of all the people who should know that, shouldn't Lindsey Graham be like at the front of the line? Uh, it, t- t- totally, totally. And this is like, and, but the scary thing, Charlie, is if Donald Trump wins the presidency again, it will be with the help of a bunch of people who literally think this. They think, you know, I don't like Trump's mean tweets or whatever, but, you know, he was good on the economy or whatever, and we can manage him. We'll just limit right. the damage he does to Israel or the Constitution or whatever. And Lindsey right? will be the Secretary of Defense or something, and he'll talk himself yeah. into like, I okay, I, you know, I am the, you know, I will, I will, I will protect the world from him because I'll be his Secretary of Defense for like five minutes until, you know, I get thrown into the, you know, thrown under the bus by by the Donald. Right, and and what we have to convince these people of is you don't get to choose. You don't get Trump a la carte. You get Trump, and Trump's going to do all the bad stuff you don't like in addition to the things you think he did well. Well, you know, that's that's where we're at. So what are you watching this week? What are you going to keep an eye on? Uh, well, I'm very interested. I'm, uh, I've am th- i been writing and I'm going to, hopefully this will be out tomorrow morning, um, a look back at what happened when there was a massive uh, Jewish slaughter of Palestinians 30 years ago in Israel. Mm. And what was said at that time, you didn't have all this namby-pamby, you know, excuses for the, for the terrorists. Israel and its allies and the United States and Jewish groups were out very clearly talking about the, the the evil of this act. And, and that's, that's what we need more people on the other side to do. We need more Arab countries, more, more Muslim organizations speaking out in the same way about violence against Jews. Well, you know, I'm looking forward to that. Now, going back to Trump's comments, um, I, I, and, and the need for moral clarity. I, I do think that that was that is something that Joe Biden has actually risen to the occasion on, at least in the couple of the things he said. His public statement, his interview on sixty Minutes last night. I don't know whether you caught it. I only caught some excerpts of it. Yeah, but um, he seems to have a very clear view of of the moral stakes here, and 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 his historical perspective, and in you know looking at the pictures of what happened to the children and everything, and thinking of 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 the Holocaust. It's um, the the distance between the seriousness with which he is proposing this, and I'm not saying I'm going to agree with everything he does here. I'm, I'm, I am, I'm not giving him a blank check in, in any way. You know, I'm, I'm not going to join the, you know, rah-rah, um, you know, club here. But 
the distance between Joe Biden's seriousness and his moral clarity and Donald Trump's narcissistic recklessness, boy, could not be more dramatic. You know, and again, it's one of those moments that you're not the crazy ones if you're saying this guy's acting like a grown up, this guy's acting like a complete f- f- buffoon. Right. And, and, and it's not just that Joe Biden understands the moral clarity of the, the wrongness of killing Jews and that Israel yeah. is in the right to defend itself. It's also that he does something Donald Trump would never do, which is that at the same time that Joe Biden says that, he also talks about the Palestinian American boy who was just murdered in Illinois and Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. We have, and this goes back to what Ron DeSantis said. When politicians like Ron DeSantis go out and talk about how all the people of Gaza are anti-Semitic, that's not just like a rhetorical error. That has consequences. And I'm not going to draw a straight line, but there was, there has already been one hate murder that we know of um, after this. The the sheriff's office says that they believe this is related to the uh, situation between Hamas and Israel. Uh, a, A man murdered this boy, a boy, Right. After Ron DeSantis says, or right around the same time as Ron DeSantis says, oh, the children of God, you know, they're all indoctrinated. They're yeah. all right. So it is, this it is, is really, it is and Joe Biden, yeah. right. And Joe Biden has come out and talked about that as well and said, we must, we must not do that. He's not doing China virus. You know, he's not playing on ethnic stereotypes. Right. He's trying to stand against that and in defense of human rights. And meanwhile, I think the cha- the odds are at least 50-50 that we will see a shutdown of the federal government because of the complete dysfunction in the Congress of the United States. I mean, if if they do come up with some sort of a bipartisan power sharing agreement, which by the way, would be incredibly countercultural. I mean, that would be incredibly not on brand for 2023 to have some sort of a bipartisan compromise. So um, if, if in fact, Republicans do fall in line behind Jim Jordan, I think the chances of a government shutdown in the midst of this international crisis um, is, uh, is, is way, uh, is way higher than 50, 50. And I mean, you know, among the many mind blowing things that we have to endure, you know, the most mind blowing of all being the possible reelection of, of Donald freaking Trump. Um, sh- the, the fact that anyone would even contemplate shutting down the federal government, uh, during this particular period of time is just, I, but you know, here we are, if only they had been tr- warned. Charlie, can I have a do-over? So last week we talked about this and I said it didn't really matter that McCarthy was out, you know, mm-hmm. because Congress wasn't really relevant to the situation in Israel. Yeah. Totally wrong. I was totally yeah. wrong because all of a sudden, if you need appropriations, if you need yeah. money to be, uh, and, I, you know, Israel's in a better position than Ukraine yeah. vis-a-vis the money, but like to the extent that Israel needs money and they do are trying to get an appropriation, if you don't have a speaker, you don't have a house, you can't pass anything, and that's a major, major problem. So we do need the Republicans to get their act together, among other reasons, on behalf of Israel. And, and this is one of those moments of political crisis and of American weakness that is completely and utterly self-inflicted. No one is doing this to us. The Russians are not doing it to us. The Chinese are not doing it to us. We are doing it to ourselves, or at least the Republicans are doing it to themselves. And unfortunately, we are the collateral damage. Will. It's going to be a hell of a week. Uh, We'll have to catch up again next Monday. All right, Charlie. Thanks. All right. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening. And we will be back tomorrow and do this all over again.